Podcast. Well, welcome to another edition of Jump To It for irishracing.com, our betting preview for this weekend's action. We've got a couple of feature races to talk about at Nace as well as at Cheltenham. Now, we are going to be focusing heavily on the Saturday races. Now, we've got the declarations in place. Don't have them yet for Sunday, but we will touch on those races later on in the show. My guest to discuss all the action is, uh, of course, Ed Quigley and Stephen Harris. Chaps, are you well? Start with you, Ed. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, Chowton, three days of action. Really looking forward to this. As you can probably tell, I have been since about the first week of uh, last April or there or thereabouts. But yeah, look, it's uh, it's a cracking three days. Really looking forward to it. Obviously, the highlight being the, the big one on Saturday, the Paddy Power Gold Cup, which looks incredibly wide open. Uh, in my view, I, I kind of keep flip-flopping between uh, selections uh, on a kind of hourly basis. I'm going back through the previous runnings of this race. Normally, there's like a, a second season novice coming through, like your Alpha Rav or an exotic dancer type, one that you know is obviously 10 to £12 pound well in. Uh, here, I think this is, uh, you could throw over a blanket over many of these and uh, it could be really, really competitive and really looking forward to it. And Stephen, for you as well, just to go back, looking at last week's action, any kind of standout performances performances for you? Um, well, uh, from from a punting point of view, um, it was quite frustrating. I, I thought Cap de Nord ran an absolute screamer in the Badger Beer, but obviously the standout performance was Frodon winning mm. that race. I mean, I must admit, um, if you told me on Saturday morning that Frodon would end up sort of nine to four putting on for that race. I, I, I'd have thought you were absolutely around the bend. I mean, the, the market confidence behind him was absolutely incredible. And he got an absolutely brilliant ride from uh, Bryony Frost, just waiting for the first mile, not committing Frodon, then taking over uh, and maintaining a fantastic gallop throughout. I, I thought that was the best performance uh, of an amazing weight carrying performance. But we've said this time and time again, Joe, haven't we, over the last years of doing jump to it paul nichols on a saturday he just gets these horses absolutely f primed when the big prize money's on offer i mean i think his strike rate since the first of october is nudging 40 percent uh, and there's no sign of it stopping yeah exactly well you'll, we'll get to some of his runners as well for uh, saturday's races again later on in the show uh, but first of all we're going to talk about uh, the race at uh, race at nace so the 12 55 uh, so ed just take us through uh, basically how you're seeing this race lining up, we've got Brazil against Phil Dore. Yeah, a trappy old encounter, isn't it, really, in that sense? Uh, I mean, Prairie Dancer on the figures isn't a million miles out of this, but no, it does look a bit of a match on paper. With Phil Dore, though, you've listened to Connections, it, it's very much kind of this feels like a prep before going chasing, mm -hmm. uh, if you see what I'm saying. So I'm always slightly sceptical when I, when I hear that. Look, it could be that he's natural class, you know, he's a horse who who finished runner-up in the Triumph Hurdle, his natural class could kind of see him through here. But I would be worried the fact that he's got to concede weight, give weight away to Brazil. And I just get the feeling with this Gordon Elliott runner, perhaps there are other targets and other ambitions ahead, which he'll be perhaps primed for later in the season. And imagine a switch of codes as well, and he's going to go chasing. So yeah, I'd be with Brazil here, um, to me, who just looks the, the right type. He's got the course of distance form in the book. It's Galileo Colt. Got a bit of boot about him as well. And I think his, his runner-up position uh, at Tipperary behind Champ Keeley was no kind of mean form. So, yeah, all in all, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a muddling one in the sense that uh, if Phil Dorr was 1,000% revved up for this, I, I'd be all over him. But uh, I, I get a feeling this will be a little bit of a ring rust removal job with the chasing game in mind. So, yeah, Brazil for me here, Joe. And, uh, yeah, we touched on the form of Paul Nichols. I just want to touch on the form of Gordon Elliott as well and Jack Kennedy, their strike rate, 31% in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, so, Stephen, does that actually sway your thinking, maybe looking at Phil Dorr? Well, I think Ed summed it up very well. This will be another race where the market will be a really good guide, uh, Joe. Phil Dorr, we haven't seen out uh, this season yet, whereas the other one, Brazil, has had a pipe note for Tipperary. By the way, very weak in the market at Tipperary uh, and ridden accordingly. I think it was eight and double figures on the exchanges never really landed a blow there, but did shape perfectly well. I mean, I like Phil Dorr. I think I was on probably every single run last season. Had a good go in the Triumph Hurdle each way. Ran an absolute blinder up on the hammer throughout and rallying. I mean, I'm slightly surprised with Phil Dorr. Ed says, and he's right, they're going to go chasing sooner rather than later. I think Phil Dorr needs further, two mile four at least. Very much a stayer, a grinder, a galloper rather than a quickener. Whereas Brazil does have a turn of foot. So... The market will guide here. I mean, at the minute, we're looking at sort of 11 to 8 and 6 to 4. 
Um, if there's any sort of fitness concerns about Phil Dorr, the market look, could look very different come the off. And just looking at the conditions at Nace as well, we're expecting soft ground. So, I mean, how big a factor do you think that will play into the running of the race? And no, I think both of them handle soft ground. F Phil Dorr um, would be fine on soft ground. It will make it more of a stamina test at, at two miles. Uh, whereas Brazil as well has got plenty of winning form on soft ground. I don't, I don't think it would be a factor for either. We should come on to talk about the ground at Cheltenham later on because um, Ed obviously lives 100 yards from the winning line at Cheltenham. And it's good ground, I think, at the minute. And looking at the weather forecast, three dry, mild, windy days. So I, I wouldn't be surprised fast ground by Sunday at all. Yeah, exactly. Like you say, we'll get to that later on the show. There was one more race at Nace we just wanted to cover. Uh, so this was looking actually far more interesting maybe at the entry stage. Now down to only five runners here. So we have, uh, of course, the Poplar Square uh, chase. Gentlemen, to me, Ed, I want to get your thoughts on him. Obviously going into this one, one to three. But what do you think about his prospects for the season? Yeah, I think he's got uh, some pretty good prospects for the season. It has to be said. Uh, in, in terms of we, we, you know, we're in the studio every day, weren't we? Having a, an anti-post look at the champion chase. He's gentleman to me is a double-figure price uh, for the Queen Mother, and I can only kind of see his price heading south in the next couple of months. Um, I kind of get the feeling this is a prep for having a, a crack at the Tingle Creek at Sandown next month. But this is also really he's just taking his form to new levels. I mean, he's only six. He seems to be. One of these typical Willie Mullins rapid improvers who just suddenly go from strength to strength. And his performance at Aintree was terrific, where he made a, a very, very good yardstick in Edwardstone look ordinary. Now, perhaps some people were saying, well, Edwardstone was feeling the effects of a, of a long, hard season, etc., etc. Mm. But Tom Cannon and Alan King were very quick to poo poo that. I mean, Tom Cannon mm. basically said that we've just bumped into a very good one here in Gentleman to me. He quickened up, went past Edwardstone like he was stood still. Now, as regards this actual race at Nace, well, gentlemen, fitness has got to be taken on trust, obviously, with uh, gentlemen to me and the, the second in here, Cool Sublime. Um, whereas Jeremy's Flame does have the fitness edge and the, the penalty structure uh, does bring the others into it. And you could argue gentlemen to me is probably too short at that price because on official figures, gentlemen to me has £12 uh, in hand over Cool Sublime, but has to concede nine. So it does kind of bring Cool Sublime on the figures right into this and uh, same with jeremy's flame as well and she gets her mayor's allowance so uh, the way this race is, is set up in its weight structure does give a chance to the others and of course uh, as stephen often says the markets will guide when fitness your your first and second favorites haven't run for six months and you know fitness has to be taken on trust of the market in regards to fitness will guide but gentlemen to me the, the, the bigger picture being there are bigger pictures uh, they're talking of Tingle Creeks, they're talking of some of the, the, the big grey ones, and they're talking of champion chases. So uh, regardless of what happens here, and if Gentleman to me does need uh, the run and there's a bit of an upset, I wouldn't be totally putting a line through him uh, from dining at the top table for the remainder of the season, put it that way. Yeah, I think that sums that nicely. Uh, Stephen, any further uh, points to add on this race? No, I think Ed's spot on again. I mean, Jed, to me, that performance at Aintree made all the run. He is a bold front runner. He's got a high cruising speed. Um, Aintree does really suit those tactics. And maybe Edwardstone wasn't quite his best. I, I probably don't subscribe to that theory. I think Edwardstone gave his running. It was just that Gentleman, to me, took to Aintree like a duck to water, flew every fence bar four out and just sustained a really strong gallop throughout. I expect he'll make all and land the odds. But as Ed said, you know, this won't be the main target. It's a dangerous business back in horses first time, especially front runners. I mean, Jeremy's uh, flame is a front runner as well. So that's a slight concern if you want to have a, a worry. I, I would be amazed if Jeremy's flame was good enough, having seen him win at Galway last time out. So Cursebleem looks the only other runner, but uh, the market's got the prices about right. Great stuff. All right, well, let's move on to Cheltenham, as we've kind of touched on already in the show. But we're going to start off with the uh, the Arkle trial. Uh, but before we do, Ed, yes, give us an update on what you think the conditions are going to be like. Yeah, Stephen, potentially very good ground, uh, quick racing, of course, uh, given the conditions. Yeah, indeed. I mean, last weekend, uh, with the rain was absolutely bouncing off uh, the roof here. I needed the pedalo to get across the lawn to the garden shed. I mean, it was ridiculous, but we've had more or less four days of, of dry weather. But the, the, the key, going in proper Michael Fish territory here, but the key, I'm told, is the temperature. And usually at this time of year, um, the, the moisture doesn't evaporate and get out of the ground. Well, you know, the forecast is 17 degrees and sun 
mm. for Cheltenham on Saturday. I mean, going to come back sunburn. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous, really, the middle of November. So the ground is is drying up rapidly. Uh, that is the bottom line. Uh, it's dried overnight from good to soft, good in places, too good. And there's um, two, three days of dry weather. So uh, Stephen did make a good point. By Sunday, um, by Greatwood Hurdle Day, I'd imagine it to be riding on the, the quick side of good, providing they, they don't do any kind of watering or anything. So, yeah, usually this time of year, you're looking for those kind of mudlarks, you know, previous renewals of this, you know, the splashes of gingers of this world and tranquil seas running around where the jockeys have got nine pairs of goggles on. There are only three finishers. Well, far from it here. We're going to have almost spring ground, fastly run contest, and it, it should be thrilling. All right, so let's start off with that opening. Uh, so the 145, the Arkle trial. Now, we touched on the form of Paul Nichols as well. So I want to get your view, Ed, on Monreal. Uh, so, yeah, Nichols very keen on this one, two to one at the moment. Uh, what do you make of it? Absolute belter, isn't it, this race? Uh, what, a, what a contest Ooh. here. Look, I mean, it's tricky because he's got to concede fitness and for chasing experience, hasn't he? That kind of throws a, a bit of a conundrum here. Um, as a general rule, I know a lot of people will probably uh, bring out some hipster stat out of the, the, the wardrobe to prove me wrong, but chase debutants at Charlton just generally do get me nervous. We saw it with mm. a couple of horses at the uh, October meeting. I would always like to have seen a horse go around, you know, greatest respect, around in Newton Abbott or Worcester and just had a sighter before coming to Charlton, especially in a, in a grade two first time out. Um, however, you said Paul Nichols was absolute genius. Uh, whatever his secret code is to scolding horses. I mean, his horses just seem like immaculate from day one over fences. So if he's fully revved up and he can jump me the first time of asking, I think he will take a lot of beating. But so much competition in here against him. Obviously, Bambridge uh, won very nicely on Chase debut. Uh, has got some good course form in the book as well from the festival. Dropping trip, bit of a question mark for that one. Uh, Penton Hills, of course, was involved in Stephen's favourite race of the season uh, at Huntingdon. Uh, last time out in, oh. in the walkover, he, he jumped superbly mm. on that occasion. But yeah, the, the the previous Triumph Hurdle winner, you know, on his peak form would have a chance. And he got sole pretender and ratings in in this. Tommy's Oscar, of course, uh, rated 156. Officially, the the best horse in the field. Will the ground be going against Tommy's Oscar? That would be a bit of a concern. But you know, that was a horse who was mm. they thought good enough to run him in a Champion Hurdle. All in all, convoluted way of saying I've not got a clue who wins it. But I think there's some very good horses in it. Glory of Fortune, she mentioned, oh, fifth in the champion hurdle. This is a hot race. Uh, I think it's the type of race you could perhaps run four or five times and get a different, at this stage of the season, get a different winner on each occasion. So nonetheless, uh, this is an absolute notepad job to the maximum. Yeah, from a spectating point of view, obviously, yeah, should be really good for the kind of the neutral. But Stephen, do you have a particular angle that, for the punters um, and a yeah, strong view of yourself? Well, I have got quite a strong view. I mean, there's seven runners, unfortunately. If there'd been eight, you'd be, you'd be queuing up to play it wherever you could because it's not got a bad shape. There's a mythical horse, Fuzane, who can't win and, and sole pretender's hard to fancy as well. I've had a negative for Mon Morel. I don't think his schooling's been wonderful at home. Now, that could turn out to be a put away and all the rest of it. But for what it's worth, um, I think Mon Morel will be quite a big drifter. Uh, I don't think it'll be short, shorter than the five to two years now anyway. He had a very disappointing season last year. He managed to get to the track three times, well beaten, well beaten, and then picked up the pieces to finish second on his final start, a remote second at that. So he's got loads to prove, and I think there's a chance he'll need the run as well. So I suspect he might be a big drifter. So I've sort of got left Pentland Hills. We don't know anything about him. Obviously, it was a walk over the other day, absolute farce. Um, well, how much ability he retains, we know. So you're, I've got left with Bambridge, who's fit, will like good ground, is going to lead, almost certainly, jumped superbly the other day. Obviously, miles up in class here, but um, I th I've been left with Bambridge. And the one I think is definitely well overpriced is Glory and Fortune, um, who actually ran an absolute screamer in the champion hurdle here last season. Now, the problem with Glory and Fortune is that he's run twice over fences back when the old Queen was alive in the 2020 and didn't really take to it. But obviously, Tom Lace is a very good trainer. His horse is starting to run well, hopefully been schooling glory and fortune over and over again to get him jumping fluently if he can jump fluently he likes good ground he's run well over hurdles here as i say um, he had a pipe opener at foss last where he caught the eye under a negative ride on his seasonal reappearance um, 12 to 1 could be a very fair price so i think my move into the race is to back um glory and fortune at a double figure price and banbridge to start off anyway because i think banbridge will lead jump fluently and be trading a lot shorter 
um, after 100 yards. Um, coming back to the bottom one, Tommy's Oscar, I think Ed's absolutely right there. If it's good, good, good fast ground, uh, that's not Tommy's Oscar's game at all. He, he was unimpressive at Carlisle for me on his chasing debut. I didn't particularly uh, think he jumped brilliantly and he made very hard work of beating an inferior rival. So I think he's got quite a lot to prove. So um, glory and fortune for me at sort of 12 to 1. Nice one. I do like that tactic, actually, yeah, with the yeah Bambridge outright and then looking at Glory and Fortune potentially to come down in price uh, later on. Right, let's move on to the 220. So the big race, as Ed's already alluded to earlier on in the show, the Paddy Power Gold Cup. Ed, take it away with your line of thinking here. Right, yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got about three hours of filming, haven't we, uh, Joe? <laughs> before the show ends? Yeah, we're, um, no, uh, this is, as I said at the top of the show, I think this is uh, incredibly competitive. Now, usually, you know, that's the cliche phrase, he's ready, big Saturday handicap. But what I mean is, normally, I was going back through previous years of this, there are two or three horses, like the kind of unexposed second season novices, are really leaping off the page at you as ones well that you know are going to end up a stone better by the end of the season. And it's just a case of who's kind of ready on the day. Here, I don't mean it in a, in a horrible way. I think we've got a bunch of very good handicappers at the moment. And the point being, I think you can throw a blanket over five or six of these. You can, there's form lines that are clashing on their peak form. You can make cases for, for, for them from different angles. There's lots of good ground form in here, which is why I think the... Uh, you know, the, the field size is, is, is backed up, funny enough. I think there's a lot of trainers who are thinking, crikey, we've almost got April ground in uh, in November. So let's have a go. And so all in all, I think it's incredibly difficult. I, I, I can't say anything with any real confidence, but if I'm going to nail my colours to the mast, the ground will be absolutely no problem for stolen silver for Sam uh, Twister Davis and Sam Thomas. Now, I spoke about the unexposed types coming through. He would fit very much still into that category. He's only seven. He was last seen bolting up here at the April meeting on, on quick ground by 11 He's kind of going through the gears, if you like. Uh, so he is one of the more unexposed types. I'd be, I'd be shocked if he ended up kind of a Ryanair chase candidate or anything like that by the end of the season. But I think you get my point. I think he's one of the more lightly raced and open to improvement sorts. And he loves Charlton. He's got good form here. And uh, it's, like, it's in his CV, but the ground is crucial to him. Uh, I know Connection was absolutely mortified uh, before he's run at the festival uh, in the plate where he finished fourth. It was a cracker, but the ground just went against him. I and mean, you remember that Wednesday, the day before, mm. Joe, you know, it was absolute carnage with the rain, mm. with uh, Brave Man's game being pulled out and yeah. Shishkin being pulled up. It was ridiculous, wasn't it? 20 millimetres in the space of 12 hours or whatever. And the ground just went for him. Nonetheless, I think he still ran a cracker. Get him on some good ground. He's destructive. I didn't see which way he went when he won at Market Raisin last year on the sound service. And as I said, it Cheltenham in the April meeting, that 40 grand pot. Uh, again, he just jumped and he travelled so smoothly on good ground. So I think the ground is crucial to him personally. He's going to get it. I think he's an each way play um, in a race where you can make a case for half a dozen of these. And, you know, the likes of Garlor got to come into it. Uh, obviously, those towards the top of the market. There was a real left of field oldie in here which I know the Twitterati like to get after me for. I don't think the top weight, Mr. Fisher, is out of this by any stretch of the imagination. He is on his on his A game. He's a, a very good grade two horse, if you see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. when he gets some decent ground and he's in the mood. And in a race where I've kind of said, I think there are a lot of handicappers in here. If he clicked on his A game at 20 to one, that price could look absolutely uh, astonishing in the aftermath, if being the operative word. But on balance, going to play the percentages, uh, stolen silver each way from me to use Stephen's line. Uh, Joe, always look for your, your each way concessions here. The bookmakers might start playing funny business on the morning or just before the race. But stolen silver each way for Sam Thomas, Sam Twiston Davis. Great stuff. And uh, Stephen, your point of view here on the Paddy Power Gold Cup? Well, Remarkably, Ed and I, um, there's been no conferring at the back. We, I, I've selected stolen silver as well. I really no. like Sam Thomas. <laughs> He's got a lovely team of young horses, and, and his win over this track and trip um, when we last saw him was that really impressive. And he's a good ground glider, a brilliant jumper. And um, the thing to say here, we've got the biggest notebook horse of the season so far, Editor Dujit, um, who's going to be around about a twenty to one chance. I, th I would imagine this is going to be another sighter. He was given an extraordinary ride on his seasonal debut having drifted from three to one to ten on the exchanges dropped out schooled round the back and picked up the pieces late he is going to be targeted at a big saturday handicap but i'm guessing it's not going to be this one looking at the early market anyway um cool cody 
bold front runner. There's going to be a really, really strong gallop in it. Let's just pray, Joe, that we get the 16 turn up because I should think that is probably a very big price on a Saturday that they'll all appear and we get four places. But it's a belting good race. There's loads of pace on. I think Stolen Silver's almost certain to give his running. I mean, he has got a much higher mark to defy and it's first time out. But Sam Thomas had one or two horses run really well uh, and, and one, one winner in the last week. So plenty of encouragement for Stolen Silver. Lovely stuff. Well, yeah, from ringing endorsements from both of our experts here. So, yeah, Thanks. Stolen Silver looks like a uh, pretty decent play. Uh, now we're going to go on to the final race we're going to look at kind of in focus here on the show, the 255. Uh, take us through this one, the Paddy Power Games Handicap Hurdle. Yeah, I mean, Shearer looks the obvious one to uh, to hit the target, excuse the pun, but uh, yeah, look, he's the progressive sort, he's the unexposed six-year-old going places. You do have a lot of horses who, uh, to be fair, have probably seen their best days, but uh, on last week's show, I tipped an on-runner, and I'm going to go in again here. This is Liz Degar Oscar, who um, I believe stood on a stone getting off the horse box uh, last week, so missed the, the assignment last weekend. Um, really interesting, just on old form. Look, could be totally gone at the game. It's been pulled up three times out of the last four uh, times this horse has made it to the track. However, has absolutely plummeted down the weights. I mean, let's not forget, this is a, a, a stayers hurdle winner two years ago. It's rated up in the 160s. Down to 142. Rob James claiming a further seven. You know, in theory, running off 135 in a handicap. Um, a big old price for a horse who's back class would wipe the floor with pretty much most of the field here. Has to be taken on trust. The horse could have um, just decided that it's time to throw the towel in. But it's just the type of price where it is cheap to find out, if you see what I'm saying. I'd much mm. rather back uh, Lisdegar Oscar this type of race than in a three-runner pokey affair where he's going off nine to four or something. And uh, th this type of race, 16 to one, strong gallop, or may all feel quite familiar for him. Obviously, it was the new course where he won the stayers hurdle, but uh, just on back class, as I said, dropped down the weights. In theory, off one three five, he's come down two stone in the space of a year. Uh, I could not let him go unbacked off that type of market at that type of price. Yeah, great stuff. Now, yeah, Stephen, I know you're uh, quite keen on Shearer as well. I wanted to do the whole Shearer screaming, but that might be a little bit <laughs> off-putting for some people. Uh, but yeah, take us through your thoughts on Shearer. And um, yeah, is it just down to the nickel's form or is it just, uh, yeah, the horse is that good? I think this is one of those typical Cheltenham handicaps where it's not as competitive as the numbers suggest. I mean, I think Ed's found one in Liz Nagar Oscar, but uh, talk, I think Liz Nagar Oscar needs proper soft ground and it's likely to be quite quick. I mean, I half wouldn't be surprised they didn't run him. I think Liz Nagaros could be winning at Foss Lass on a Sunday in, in soft ground at some point. Rebecca Curtis usually finds a, a race there at the weekend when it's really testing. I mean, Liz Nagaros is incredibly well handicapped. She can get him back. Um, he's absolutely chucked in it. But I suspect if he runs, it might not be, today might not be the day in this contest with the boy riding. Um, I think Shearer, been a revelation this season for Nichols, a smooth traveller with a turn of foot who needs producing late, was pretty impressive here at the last meeting, quickening up readily. And I think he's got a perfect makeup again. I, I'll be amazed if he isn't sort of bang there, jumping the last. Heskin knows him really well. He is quirky. He needs producing late. I think he'll he'll be bang there. That The weights rise is neither here nor there. The other runner, and I don't think there's that many of them uh, for me, is Paddle Your Own Canoe of Dan Skelton. Now, this one um, ran really well once for Skelton since arriving from Tizard last season. He's a horse who's had loads of problems. He's another one, a bit like Liz Nagaroska. Um, if you go back far enough in the form book, he's incredibly well treated. And I think the Skeltons think they've got him back. And there's been plenty of money from the right people in the build-up to the race this week. So he's a very interesting runner. Back over hurdles, back on decent ground. Hurry up. Tristan Durrell rode him for his final start last season, which was here. Uh, he was a bit better than the bare result there. He's been off for a while, but he's fit and ready and he should run well. But I think there's not many runners here. I think Shearer, who's around four to one, is one of the better bets of the weekend. Maybe save your stake with Skelton's. Lovely stuff. All right, we'll get to our tips or your tips of the week shortly. But Ed, I just wanted to get your views on some of the Sunday action. So we talked off air a little bit about the Schlur chase. Just take us through some of your thoughts there, provided we get the matchup, of course. Uh, which way do you see it going? I'll be with uh, Nube Negra. I think the ground's going to come right for him. Mm. He's, you know, he absolutely hosed up in this race uh, last time he ran in it, where 
I think he's a very finicky horse. Don't forget, they pulled him out on the morning of the champion chase on, on when, when the ground went. He's a bit of a the new Stevens phrase. He is a glider. He does love mm. good ground, kind of small field, whiz round. Uh, I just wonder whether he might have a bit too much zip for Edward Stone, uh, personally. Uh, and I imagine the Scouts have got him pretty revved up for this. So, yeah, I'd be with Nube Negra. Uh, others to note uh, throughout the weekend, of course, I think we've got Fernie Hollow. Obviously, we don't have the decks at the time of recording, mm. but potentially Fernie Hollow uh, running in Ireland as well, which would be something to take note of. Currently, third favourite. Uh, for the champion chase. I think that horse is due to run it in Navan. And then um, also uh, at Cheltenham, I'd be looking at uh, the Greatwood Hurdle. I do like Nigel Twisted Davis's horse. Uh, I like to move it. He's got some very good course form, goes well fresh, uh, enjoys good ground. So uh, they're definitely ones to keep an eye on. But yes, we see from that graphic in front of us there, Joe. Uh, Fernie Hollow, Gentleman to Me. Obviously, Gentleman to Me running a day earlier. Fernie Hollow, horse with a lot of ability incredibly fragile It'd be great to see him back on the track and uh, and you know a nice clean spin and get the job done it'd, it'd be great to see him uh, you know back to his best so yeah fascinating weekend of action yeah i'll be with uh, nube negra and i like to move it my two selections at cheltenham on sunday Lovely stuff. Well, Ed, stick with you then. We'll go for your tips of the week i think you touched on most of them already but just take us through your selections yeah, my nap will be, I like to move it in the Greatwood Hurdle, uh, a horse with some very good form on the old course, uh, on good ground, arguably in small fields, he's, he's got his best work done. However, he did prove he could handle the hustle and bustle of a, of a big handicap when he was beating a, a short head in the uh, the Betfair Hurdle at Newbury. Uh, I think he was over the top and I don't think the, uh, the stamina demanding new course for the County Hurdle helped him when he disappointed. It was probably one run too many for the season but I, I think he's a big old price in this he'll be fresh he'll be raring to go uh the team twister i think can get the job done where i like to move it uh stolen silver after being rather hypocritical and saying eight or nine of them can win it i i still think stolen silver is that is the value call because as steven says it's hard to see how he won't run his race uh, i mean he's got his ground yes he's up to a career high mark but sam thomas you are absolutely flying uh, we spoke mm. about Paul Nichols, you know, from a bigger sample size, he's been operating at 40%. Uh, well, Sam Thomas isn't far off that for November. So the yard of flying, uh, I think Stolen Silver has got a cracking each way chance in, in, in that race. And then, yeah, the, the long shot might easily be a non-runner again. This is becoming a bit of a theme with this horse. But at least I've got Oscar. I've got a chance him at 16, 20 to 1. As I said, he's absolutely dropped to a basement mark. If the horse shows any of his old spot, you know, he was bossing the grey one field, the likes of Paisley Park and so, and company actually cooked behind him two years ago. Off 135, he could feel like he's running loose. So he gets the uh, the long shot vote there, Joe. Perfect. Great. Uh, best of luck as well for you, Ed. And Stephen, take us through your selections, please. Yeah, we've done a couple of them already. Um, the nap is in the 255 at Cheltenham on Saturday. Shearer. A good ground glider with a turn of foot. Heskin knows him really well. I think it's a very uncompetitive race. Paddle your own canoe's the danger for me. I'll be disappointed if Shira doesn't go really close. Um, again, on Saturday, the 145. Um, I think this is a good race to play. And I don't fancy Mon Morale. I'll be against him, win and place. Um, I think the top one's a big run of Bambridge. But glory and fortune. You take it, he's jumping on trust. He hasn't run over hurdles for two years. Um, but he's a very useful hurdler. He needs good ground. Tom Lacey's beginning to warm up after missing the summer. Um, if he can jump fluently, I think he'll go really close at a track where he's run really well at in the past. And my long shot, hopefully be a double figure price, uh, 3.30 at Cheltenham. Guernsey uh, got rid of his jockey early at Sandown in a swamp on Sunday, but previously at Warwick, I thought he was quite impressive. I think he found the track sharp enough at Warwick, but he overcame it and still powered through to win. He's much more settled now, and I think Cheltenham will suit him in a big field. They'll go a right gallop. And just to touch on Ed, I think Ed's absolutely found one in the Greatwood. That is a really good shout. There's a horse that I can't have on my mind, Sonagina of Nichols, who's about a 5-1 to one chance. He's up £10 for winning two races. He's been gifted at Chepstow. He was on the best of the ground wide last time. I don't fancy him at all. So the one Ed's found of Nigel Twiston Davis, totally agree with that one. Absolutely ringing endorsement, we're, we're, Ed. We're agreeing on everything. What's going on? <laughs> Two, uh, it's going to be disaster, isn't it? Absolute disaster. 
<laughs> so of course, uh, yeah, that wraps it up for today's show. So thanks a lot, Stephen and Ed, for your selections. Follow uh, all of your horses on irishracing.com. Use the horse tracker. You can actually go and get notified on the performances of all the selections. And of course, if you do place a bet, as always, please do gamble responsibly. We'll be back very soon here on irishracing.com. <laughs>